Hello and welcome to Conversations with Atlanta's Movers and Shakers. I am your host, Mandy Sue Johnson. Today, we are having a conversation with actor, producer, filmmaker, member of Atlanta's SAG-AFTRA Indie Outreach Committee, judge of the daytime Emmys, Ronell Ricardo Parham. Hi, Ronell, how are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. I love that introduction. You're welcome. So we, sh uh, we shared a little bit about what it is that you do in the Atlanta film and TV. Can you share a little bit more about who you are and what it is you do in the Atlanta film and TV community? Sure, so um, <clears throat> who am I? I am, <clears throat> excuse me, I am a kid from West Philly. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, I'm a kid from West Philadelphia. And I know the uh, Fresh Prince song probably is illuminating, um, but I, I am from West Philly and uh, actually a few of my family members went to high school when we're in Will Smith's graduating class. Wow. But um, so yeah, I am a filmmaker, content creator, uh, producer, actor, writer, director. Um, what I would like to do and what I'm continuing to do in the Atlanta community is uh, continue to just push this uh, this idea, this phenomenon of indie filmmaking. I mean, it's it's not new. It's it's not new by any stretch of the imagination, but I just feel like a lot of actors, a lot of creatives really don't see like the significance in it. Um, and I get it too. I totally understand where they're coming from. It's a slow grind. Um, it's slow progress. This whole business is is slow progress and, and a slow grind. But um, it's it's very challenging to be an indie filmmaker. It's very challenging to shoot your own stuff. But um, one thing I would like to continue to do in Atlanta and wherever I go is to uh, continue to encourage people that you know their stories are important, that their ideas are important. Um, it is very wise for them to become uh, multi-talented in the business and learn to do different things, whether it's in front of the camera or behind the camera, because too, too, too often and not, I feel like our voices are being just stifled and held back because we don't have that push, we don't have the knowledge to, to and we don't have the connections to create our own stuff. So. Um, that's why I hopped on and and uh, glad I was accepted to become a member of the SAG uh, Atlanta um, indie outreach community. So yeah, that's that's kind of some goals that I would like to do in Atlanta and and wherever I go. Okay, yeah. Well, um, when I was looking up you for your interview, I was like, oh wow, he's from West Philly, and immediately the Fresh Prince of Bel Air song popped in my head. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So you fell in love with acting at the age of 20 when you took an on-camera commercial acting class. Can you share with us what it was that made you fall in love with acting? Oh, wow, that's, that's a really great question. Um, what made me fall in love with it, just the challenge and just the expression um, of being an actor, being an artist. Um, I didn't grow up acting. I didn't even think about it. Like before I was 20 years old and I took that class, I mean, if I might, I never probably had the conversation like, oh, maybe I should become an actor. Like I saw kids in theater growing up and the drama, drama clubs and drama class and in school and things like that. And it just didn't connect with me. It just never connected with me, possibly because I grew up playing the drums. Okay. So I played the drums for 11, 12 years of my life. And um, it was great. You know, it was great. I played basketball as well. So drums and basketball were like the things that were really kind of taking up my time um, as I was growing up. So taking that uh, commercial classes people had told me you know you should try and model and, and do this and do that but no one ever really told me you should try and be in commercials mm -hmm. so one thing I don't mention well I, I, I just elaborate more on is uh, when I met with that talent agent and uh, I remember exactly who she is I remember where her office is she's not she's not in business anymore but um, she said to me uh, other than the modeling she said yeah you should 
think about being in commercials. And that was the first time that <clears throat> someone really said that to me and then it clicked. Um, and then I went and got into this class. I mean, it was like six or seven people. It wasn't a big class at all, which actually probably helped me. Mm -hmm. um, and I just remember learning these things, like learning these, these on-camera techniques and doing um, these little sides and these little paragraphs and then going up you know, memorizing it for a second, just getting in that routine of like getting some copy, memorizing it and going up and doing it and then taking direction. But I, I just became fascinated with seeing myself on camera. I became fascinated with taking direction and then seeing myself again. So watching all the things that I've watched, all the movies and TV shows that I've watched and why it moved me, I started to understand what these people were doing, what they were learning, how it just takes so much repetition, but it just became this whole fascinating process for me to um, take what was written, make that into my own, see it on a camera, and then to make somebody feel something from that. So just the whole process I, I, I immediately fell in love with. And um, it helped too, I'm not gonna lie, it helped that, you know, once I got the professional materials together that people were responding to me, people wanted to interview me, um, I started getting auditions. I think within four or five months of me getting a manager and getting headshots, I got booked my first, uh, it was like a regional, but then they did a couple, they did a national run for it for a few weeks. It was this uh, Toyota commercial that I did with uh, Jennifer Lopez okay. back in, um, Wow, it had, had to be either 2010 or 2011, but um, like those type of things, like that. Then I was like, oh, okay, now I'm on to something. Like now I'm getting good feedback, and then I book something. I'm like, oh, okay, now I, I think I can do this. Wow, that's a that's amazing. Yeah, right. commercials. A lot of people don't talk about. Like I'm like I really would prefer to do commercials over any other thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they don't, you, you don't hear about that stuff. That's one thing too, as you do more training and you get more into the business, <clears throat> you start to understand that um, what, you, what you learn in some of these schools and some of these programs um, doesn't necessarily translate to like what you need to learn to get out here and start working. Um, in all of, in my theater classes that I took and studying theater in New York, um, again, like there's, you know, unless again, I haven't been in college or high school in a long time, but like, I don't know, if there's no commercial classes and, and, you know, I guess maybe if you go to like a conservatory or an acting program, but um, yeah, not a lot of people kind of tell you about these things. And, and, and more importantly, um, a lot of the times you aren't educated on the business side of it. Right. And that's such a huge part of it because, um, I mean, the business, that's, what's, that's what runs everything. You know, at the end of the day, it's show business, but it's really business before the show, so. Right, yes, that the business side is very important. So um, can you take us on your journey about how you began to where you are today? Um, how I began. So yeah, I just, you know, I, I started taking commercial classes. Um, then from there I went, uh, cause actually during that time I took off a semester from college. So I did my freshman year at Cheney university and then I, um, took a semester off. Well, actually in, in that time I had applied, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I'd applied to go to Temple university but uh, some things happened and they kind of like messed up my paperwork, but it actually ended up being one of the best probably blessings of disguise in my life because what that allowed me to do was I had to take the semester off because I couldn't go anywhere. Like I could have went to like community college, CCP of Philly, but I just, I just, I wanted to go do the college experience. So I, I, I remember talking to my mom about it. I'm like, look, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to go back to school. Trust me, trust me, trust me. So that semester I, I ended up working, but it was only, you know, because I had that time off that I even went to go see talent agents. And I went that I had the time to start commercial classes. 
if I wouldn't have taken that semester off, I, I just don't know if things would have connected with me at that time in terms of me finding acting or acting finding me. Um, so from there, I studied theater in undergrad. Um, uh, when I graduated undergrad, I moved to New York City. So I was uh, 22, 23 years old in New York City, absolutely no money, fresh out of college, um, and just like excited as ever to be an actor because um, previous to that, like I only been to New York maybe once or twice in my life. Like, yeah, I live in Philly, it's two and a half hours away, but it's like a different world. Philly and New York are just totally different worlds. And unless you have, you know, being from Philly, unless you have something to do up there, maybe you go up there for the day or whatever, we just didn't really go up there. Like we went up there for a couple of field trips. So um, in school, but I just remember being just super excited because I'm like, oh, now I'm in it. Now I'm in this world. Now I'm in this acting world. And New York is right here. I don't have to go to Hollywood. I don't have to do this. At that time, Atlanta hadn't really started, you know, coming up as much. Um, so I was like, oh, New York, this is, this is, I got this gem right here and it's two and a half hours away. So I just remember being so excited to just move up there. I didn't care where I lived. I didn't care. I remember when I first moved up there, I showed my mom couple of my siblings and my best friend they went and looked at this room I rented in New York and they were like they couldn't even believe it they were like you're you're gonna do this like you're gonna you're really gonna move up here and live in this and I was like yeah like this is this is at that time like I knew it I'm like this is my destiny like this is this is what I'm supposed to be doing and to them it was still new like I had taken some theater classes I'd done some commercials and things but they were like oh you know Ronell might go into something else but I knew I'm like, nah, this is this is where I need to be. So I was just going to make it happen. Um, so I did like six or seven off Broadway plays in New York, studied theater and just got really, really in the trenches, really in depth with um, the craft of acting, the history of it. Um, you know, just running all around the city, just auditioning and doing all types of things. And um from there, yeah, that took me over to uh, California. I went to Las Vegas before that, but that took me over to California. And my career really changed um, in 2017 when I started creating my own content. So I had a buddy of mine who's actually one of my producing partners. Uh, he came to me with this script, the short film that he wrote. And he said, uh, hey, I, 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 I have this script and uh, I can still add some characters to it. And uh, I wanna, you know, I, I kind of need you to help me out with this. I want you to be a producer. And at that time, I didn't know all the things that producers do. So he's like, yeah, I just kind of need this amount of money. And then, you know, this will be cool for us because it'll be like you and me in charge of the whole project. And I was like, oh, okay, that's that's interesting. I never even considered that. I was like, oh, because you, you know, you're just so used to auditioning and being on set and seeing producers or seeing directors and not bothering them and, and staying away from them because they have such an important job to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, ever since then, it just, I, I, we produced that film. We won a couple awards for it. I, it, it was, it changed my life in a sense because people were coming to me with questions about the project. How does this look? Um, the director would be turning over to me and my producing partner asking us, like, did you like it this way? Should we do it this way? Should we wait until the sun goes down a little bit more? So I was like, oh, this is, this is really cool. And then to be in the editing room and then to see, and then really to develop your skills too. That's, that's a huge part of it. Like when you, as you create your own stuff and you're in that editing room, I don't edit, but I'm in there picking the takes. I'm in there picking what happens or what sound clips we should use and all these different things. So um, yeah, th th that's a little bit of kind of my beginnings. And then, you know, from there, just been creating my own content and just, just having, streamers and and much bigger producing partners reach out to me and um yeah just fully on my way now to just creating stuff and i fully uh expect to be partnering with a major studio i'm already with a major streamer now wink wink i'll talk a little bit more about that but uh yeah i just i just expect it to keep keep going up okay that's an that's amazing so you went to westchester for theater right i did Okay, so upon leaving Westchester University and embarking upon your professional career, were there any moments of fear or self-doubt you had to conquer? And what were some of those day-to-day -day obstacles you had to overcome as a Black man operating in a space viewed primarily as a white art form? 
Um, I would say my earliest challenges was doing theater, um, was breaking out of your shell in a sense, um, learning, learning, just learning acting, like just, just being in acting class, you know, learning commercials, learning how to get up in front of a class full of people and learning how to get up in front of an acting coach or theater professor, or when you get to that point of performing, getting up in front of uh, an audience, you know, audience members that have paid to come see you or getting up in front of your friends and family. You know, it took those early experiences um, and just mental challenges I gave myself. Like I remember um, a couple of plays that I was doing in New York and, uh, you know, I was like, okay, we're going up this weekend. You know, it should be about 40 people there. It should be like 50 people there, 60 people there. And I just remember mentally just, just or subconsciously just, uh, talking to myself over and over and over again like you can do this these are your lines like you got this you got this then we would do our first show and I'd be like yeah you got it look how look how well that went second show boom boom so I would just keep having these inner dialogues with myself and then obviously the experience of doing those things just um you know added to the confidence that that I that I developed as a performer so um, navigating that as a black man in a uh, you know predominantly you know white industry, um, white male dominated industry, um, I've learned that just as important, and I'll be truthful with this, um, just as important as it is to uh, create our stories, tell our stories from my experiences, it is just as important to partner with people who don't look like us. And I say that because I've had almost everybody say to me like, oh, you should only be telling black stories. You should only be telling these stories and this and that. And I'm like, this is, this is how we've gotten into the place that we are in the business now. Like, you know, not necessarily, you know, white folks telling white stories, but you know, white, you know, white people being in leads, white people being in leads here, or majority of cast members, you see one black person, two black people, one Spanish person, one, one uh, Asian person. So it wouldn't do me any uh, good to make content and to only have it narrow, narrowly set on people and, and those, and, you know, I understand it. Like, creating ideas and if an idea that you create or a story that you tell is of all black people cool that's great but this whole like agenda pushing things that we're seeing now where it's like oh we have to have a show that's mainly this that's mainly that I'm like that's not real life like it's just you know so um yeah, I mean, those, those, that's how I would answer that question in terms of trying to navigate in a business that, that isn't, that doesn't look like us. Um, I just, I don't think, and this is personally, I just, I don't think me coming in with the mentality of, oh, I should do everything a certain way, or I should do everything with only these type of people in it. For one, that stops me creatively that stops me from telling and doing things, you know, authentically. But for two, it just, it, it, it fuels the fire of um, just the separations that we see in the business. And, and I wish everybody would kind of think the way that I think on it, but again, it's a business. So I, I understand that side of it, but um, I am fully into collaborations, telling stories. You know, I'm I'm going to start telling. I don't want to give away too many uh, too many gems here, but I'm I'm going to start telling stories of um, individuals with disabilities, and I'm going to start telling stories of people of walks of life that I will never be able to put my put my feet in their in their shoes. So, um, I just creatively, it, it would do me no good to be narrowly set on people have to look a certain way in order to be in my stuff. So. Yes, yeah, so you're very open-minded. Um, yes. I, I like I like that. You, I feel like you answered that very well. Thank um, you. So we're gonna take a break, but we'll be right back. Morning, Switch 
chat. Hey, that's kind of exciting. I know. So we grow just... up. How was your day? We need to move Parker Industries to the next level. Maybe a Jay Z in the house, you know. My entire life, I felt like I've just been this odd. Am I not the typical black guy? Yo, can you help me keep this place looking neat? Nigga, you white as hell. Why are you saying it like that? Why can't I just blend in like everybody else? When it seems to be the storyline of your entire life, you really begin to question your purpose. I got you, homie. There's too much drama going on here. I don't know what's worse. The hate that I get from other people. But why do African Americans always feel like they're the victim? Or the hate that I get from my own people. I just needed a break. I'm lost right now. I feel the same way, honestly. Welcome back to Conversations with Atlanta's Movers and Shakers. I am your host, Mandisa Johnson. Today, we are having a conversation with actor, producer, filmmaker, member of SAG-AFTRA Indie Outreach Committee, judge of the Daytime Emmys, Ronel Ricardo Parham. Can you share with us about your production company, 5R Productions? Sure. Um... Five R Productions uh, derives from my siblings and myself in a sense that um, my mother had five kids and uh, all of our names begin with R. And uh, that was very much by design of her. Uh, I feel like, um, you know, our dad, he, he didn't have too much of a say in it. I think it was, it was 100% her and that's that just, that's just how it was. And, um, <clears throat> but it was really unique that uh, she chose to do that. And uh, I remember asking her a few times, you know, why? Like, what, what was it about, you know, the letter R? Um, because my, uh, my older brother, his name is Robert, nicknamed Rudy. And then it's Ronell, me. And then it's uh, Ryan. Then it's Rhonda. Then it's Ramar. And I just, I remember asking her a few times, she never really gave me like a specific answer. I think it was just, just a, a thing. Like, I guess after, you know, she had two and she named them R, she, she just, she just went with it. But um, that's where the name comes from. So um, a lot of what I do, I'm, I'm a very family oriented person, um, a very loyal person and um, everything that I do uh, is pretty much for my family. So um, I figured it'd be a pretty cool name to, to come up with. Just, just, just the fact that I'm one of five, like, like so few people like have that many siblings and then, um, all of our names beginning with R. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to go, I'm already doing something. I'm already focused on doing something unique with my life, which is, you know, being a creative. So let me kind of, um, use this creative thing, this unique thing that we have within our family and, and, and form a production company with it. So um, what we do is uh, we specialize or, or we focus on telling stories that represent the underrepresented. So that is a, a tagline, a, a, a quote that I came up with years ago when I first started it because um, you know, the first project, uh, well, my buddy came to me, my producer partner came to me with that short film. Um, so we put that under the production company. But then the first project that I created was um, <clears throat> a project called uh, Web Series, now turned into a television series called Odd Man Out the Series. So um, I that that show is, is loosely, but pretty closely based on my life and, and my experiences growing up. In, in the adult form, I, I might, I might do some stuff, you know, I'm, I'm not going to even say that. I don't want to drop too much on y'all. Um, but it's, it's loosely based on my life. So I just, and then I just started coming up with a bunch of ideas and, and I started realizing like, instead of me trying to, in a, in a sense, outsource all these ideas, try and find all of these ideas to write about, like, why don't I keep it original to me? Like, why don't I write about things that have happened in my life, things that have happened to people that I know? Um, so, and, and, and just 
all of that just started coming to me and I'm looking at all these things I've done in my life and the different people that I've worked with and things that I've gone through. I'm like, none of these people are on TV or there's so few of us on TV. Um, and I'm like, you know what, this is, this is my time. Like this is, this is my moment to, it, I'm talking in terms of when I started forming a production company, like this is my moment to decide what we're going to do, what direction we're going to go in, what stories we're going to tell. So I based that off of that, like my, my life experiences, things that I've gone through, people that have affected me in my life, um, telling stories that represent the underrepresented. And I take that very seriously. And, and um, that's what the production company is about. That's what we try and tell all of our stories that are deeply rooted somewhere within that. Um, so from there, uh, yeah, we've done multiple web series. We've done a TV movie slash pilot that we're going to release soon. Um, Odd Man Out the series started out as a web series. Now it's a te television series that got picked up by Peacock. Um, excuse me, we've done a, a bunch of short films. We're going to continue shooting shorts and doing all that. And then uh, obviously start to transition into the feature, feature length world, um, which I'm very excited about. Have a few things in development there. So, um, but you know, as, as the saying goes, like truly started from the bottom and um, you know, just, just continued to level up. That's amazing. And that's so cool how you all have the, your first name start with an R. So I come, with a, come from a family where all our names start with an M. Wow. The crazy thing is my my mom passed away when I was seven. So I already named thank you. But my step siblings, um, I know one was four when I met her, and then the other one was a year old, but their name started with an M. Then my dad and my stepmom had another little girl started with an M. So now all my kids, their names start with an M. My oh, husband's my name he starts with an E. So <laughs> that was all me but yeah. I did watch your um odd man out and I really enjoyed that I want I, I was like oh when I was done I was like oh it's over <laughs> I wanted more so thank you so much I appreciate that you're welcome so you were recently appointed as an official member of the SAG after indie committee can you share with us about that and how you plan to push changes within the industry <clears throat> Yeah, so that was pretty cool. They reached out. Well, I, I think I'd applied uh, when I first moved to Atlanta last year, and they had like a really small window. Uh, so I was like, oh, let me just get this, you know, put in my application, tell them some stuff that I've done. Wasn't expecting to hear anything back. Uh, so it took about, you know, six, seven months or something like that for them to get back to me um, or get back to all of us. But uh, yeah, they reached out and said, uh, yeah, you're, you're an uh, uh, official committee member, because I think they have like a couple um, like sub members or something like that, or, or uh, so they have two chairs, two chairs of our of our committee, and then there's committee people, and then they have like some subcommittee people. Um, so that was really cool. I just I thought that that would that kind of um, uniquely tied into exactly where I was at in my life, where I was at in my career, and just you know in a unique place. I just moved down here. Like I think I moved down. Well, I moved down here in July, but I think I'd applied for it maybe in August or something like that. And again, they had like a small window. So I'm like, oh, this is pretty interesting that somehow, some way this like popped up in my inbox or I was on one of the SAG websites or something. And uh, I saw that. And uh, so, yeah, they, they, they messaged me back, said, you know, we'd like to welcome you in and we're having, a, a, you know, the, an initial meeting. Um, so it was myself and I think it's like 12 other people and just, just, just other, just, just a whole, we were on a Zoom, just full of just creative people, just wow. content creators, uh, filmmakers, editors. Uh, so it was great. You know, that's, that's, that's my lane. That's my vibe. I love being in rooms like that with people who are just as motivated or even more motivated than me. Um, so yeah, it was great. You know, we just, we, we had conversations about what we can do um, to, continue to educate people on just the benefits of, of self-producing and creating your own content. And um, we were thinking of, although, I mean, when we had this initial conversation, it was earlier this year, so COVID was still, 
we weren't really allowed to do a lot of in-person stuff. So we were, we were talking along the lines of um, starting to do events here in Atlanta, you know, obviously sponsored by SAG-AFTRA, um, getting people out, you know, whether, wherever we have it at, getting people out, obviously we have SAG behind us and um, just, just having workshops, whether it be online or whether it in person, but just having workshops with people, um, educating them through the processes or the, the contracts and the process of hiring actors and going through crew and uh, getting locations and then um, having a SAG rep attached to all of that. And not just that, the benefits of doing that too, in terms of protecting your production, protecting yourself, having insurance. Um, and then just on top of it, just having SAG behind your production just gives you so much more validation um, when you're producing. So, uh, you know, just just doing, just doing things like that um, is, is a big goal of ours. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how that position came about. And, um, you know, the goal is definitely for us as, you know, committee members and, and fellow filmmakers and content creators to share our experiences, filmmaking, the do's and the don'ts, um, and just to, you know, tell people the benefits. Like I, I've shot many projects um, in the indie stuff under SAG, SAG contracts. So, um, and I will full heartedly say it, it was very beneficial as opposed to doing it non-union and, you know, I get it. I get why people do a lot of stuff non-union. I totally understand it. But as you continue to create things, you continue to get higher budgets, you continue to shoot in more expensive locations, you continue to work with people that are more expensive to work with. Um, you, you learn that doing things just by the book and with SAG behind you is just the, the best way to go about it. Well, that's, that's amazing how you had just moved here and then applied and then you got it. Cause I honestly thought you were here longer than. <laughs> so, um, so speaking of relocation, so you relocated to Atlanta. So do you have any relocation tips you would like to offer to those looking to relocate here? To Atlanta? Yes. I would, um, well, just a general relocation tip for all my people out there who are thinking of moving wherever you want to move, but, uh, you know, have a job lined up, you know, obviously think first about your finances and think first about, um, you know, taking care of yourself, providing for yourself. Um, I would also say, you know, obviously it helps if you're moving one job, you're, if you're with a job and you go from location to location, because when you move to a new state, you got to apply for health insurance, you got to apply for dental, you got to go through all these processes. And again, a lot of people don't tell you these things, like, but I'll keep it real with you. Like, I came down here and a lot of like, your your when you sign up for new insurance, it takes like 30 days to come back in. So, um, you know, whatever you need, you know, just make sure that you you have those things in place. Like, you know, so just think, think ahead, think, you know, three, four months ahead of when you get down there, what you're going to need, you know, you're going to need insurance, you're going to need health insurance, you're going to need dental, you're going to need these different things, you're going to need a job, um, you know, do your research on apartments and things like that. Yes, it helps if you're moving in with roommates or you know people down here, but for me, uh, well, I was trying to buy a house, so I tried to buy a house down here, I put some offers in last year, of course, in this ridiculous market, um, I was up against 35 other offers, half of them were all cash. So I quickly decided that I'll just kind of do a loft for now. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, just put in that effort too to just research the areas. Um, and if you can, you know, come down to Atlanta a few times, uh, depending on where you are, of course, but come down here a few times and really get a layout of what it means to be in the perimeter, outside of the perimeter. Um, you know, I'm out in, in, in the suburbs of Atlanta, and I would encourage a lot of people to do that as well. Uh, living in Atlanta is cool, you know, but just start to do your research on what the rents are, you know, whatever position that you're in. If you're in a position to buy, um, you know, start reaching out to your realtors a few months beforehand. So um, I would definitely say just, you know, get your, get your, 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 your feet grounded, get grounded here as opposed to jumping right in and finding an agent and doing this and that. Like, again, I've, I've lived in five cities in my twenties. So I'm just keeping it as real with people as possible. You mentioned this whole time, I haven't even mentioned acting yet. So, so cause I want people to get their feet cemented first and make sure that you're okay. Um, because this business is so up and down 
You can be on avails. You can be on holds. You can get pinned. You can do this. You can do that. And then you don't hear back or they release you or this, then it's that. So make sure you have things in place so that you can still eat and eat well while you pursue things in Atlanta or wherever you go in this business. Um, now, with all that said, now, when you get down here and you get all your feet cemented and you're doing your thing, um, yeah, you know, start reaching out to agents. Um, you know, there's a couple cool studios here. There's green light studios. There's um, another another email thing that I'm on where they do like agent meetups and agent things and cast and director workshops and things like that. And I'm not a huge proponent of, you know, paying a lot of money for those things. I think those things are great. You know, they're, they're educational, but um, I just don't think a lot of those classes and things should be as much as they are. So um, what I tell people is email people, mm -hmm. find, do your research, find people's emails. <clears throat> you know, from my experience as agents, you know, when you get into the filmmaking side of it, you can't just blindly, you can't blindly email scripts, ideas, pitches, things like that. Nobody's going to read it. And in fact, you end up looking very amateurish if you're sending a full script. And here's another tip for people. Register your scripts with the WGA, copyright your materials before you blindly send anything out. So that's number one. But then number two, once you get into a place where you have content, you have a script that you think is ready and this and that, get a manager, find a literary agent. Literary agents are really hard to get. Um, so I would recommend, you know, kind of having your agent or, or even a theatrical agent, if you're, if you're close with them or a manager, um, they can kind of send things on your behalf to studio people, to other producers. Again, it just depends on your relationship with them. A lot of them don't want to deal with that because it makes them look a certain way. Like, oh, I have this script for one of my clients. I'm sending it to you. And they're looking at you like, what? Why aren't you just submitting your, like, why are you sending me this? So um, yeah, those are some tips for getting down here. You know, email people, get your materials together, have links to a lot of your work. People want to look at links, have Vimeo links, have YouTube links, um, have free links that people can just click in. Don't have reels that are too long. You know, have your stuff at like a minute, a minute and 15 uh, maybe even less than that sometimes, but uh, yeah, just have have clips or, or links. I'm sorry, and just start emailing people. Start finding agents. Start finding. Look, go on IMDb. Sign up for an IMDb Pro membership. I definitely recommend that to people. Um, start doing your research. I started researching top agents in Atlanta, top managers in Atlanta. Well, I have a manager, but I started researching uh, top agents in Atlanta, and then I just started narrowing it down. Started applying to people. A few people hit me back. Some people didn't reply back. A couple others wanted me to do uh, uh, auditions for them. Ended up signing with some agents. So, you know, hopefully those, you know, those are some good tools for people when you get down here. Hey, those are some great tips. Um, nobody ever talks about not ever moving into the city. We live in the city. We're in near downtown Decatur, but like we used to live in the suburbs. So it is a lot you get a lot uh, more money and a lot for space. Right. So like we lived in like a, a big three, four bedroom home in Conyers. We okay. moving out here, you know, you're gonna pay like homes out here are like a million dollars. Literally. Yeah. yeah. You said you're in downtown Decatur? Yes. Yeah, Decatur's nice. Yeah, it is, it is nice. Um, and then if you have kids, you know, you have to think about the area where the the school like good right. school system so you gave some really really good tips so i did have a question for you that i just thought of but um you talked about not you weren't really you didn't you don't really agree with like paying a lot of money for certain things you said something about like sending emails so how important to you is networking yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. Networking is huge um, in this business. Um, but you have to network the right way. It's funny you mentioned this too, because um, uh, I, I don't know where I was. I was on Twitter. I was on something looking at, at something. And then Issa Rae said something where it was network across. Don't network up. Um, network with the people around you, meaning find people that are just as hungry as you or hungrier that understand the business too. 
it's 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 great to have people who are very motivated around you um but you know have people across from you have people that are on your level um that you're networking with that you're building with um and again it's not to say you know what i work with what i work with someone who's never produced anything that you know that they wanted to get some experience working with me i probably would because that person is going to bust their butt on set they're going to listen they're going to do pretty much anything i ask them to do and they're going to help so in that sense like it's always great to kind of work with people from many different levels but i think what isa was alluding to was like so many times so 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 often and not like we want to we want that home run we want to hit it out the park we want to send our stuff to somebody they hit us back and then oh yeah come on and meet with the execs come on down and meet with the execs at hulu in, in santa monica you know or come come down to tyler perry studios and meet tyler you know the chances of that happening are just so slim to none that um what you need to do is continue to network with the people on your level because what that is going to do it is that's going to keep leveling you up to the point where you hopefully get to an area where you know Tyler will be asking to meet with you or somebody at Hulu will be emailing you talking about oh we just saw odd man out you know how long have you been shooting this show you know what are your plans for this show like so more often than not people you know we want to just shoot you know hit that home run and 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 you know but we we forget about the importance of you know networking at where you are like have something to network with is is another thing i tell people like it's all it's great to go out and meet people oh hey i'm this and that and i'm a good looking face and i'm an actor oh i'm an actor i'm an actor i'm an actor first thing people are going to say is oh okay what have you done or or, or or what are you go you know what are you in or what are you producing or what are you doing this and that so what i like to tell people and one of my one of my friends who, who's a little bit older um in the business a uh, bunch of credits a lot of things like that he tells me like you know content is king you know if you're going to continue to network and you're going to continue to meet with people have as much content in your bag as you possibly can because now you have things to talk about now you have things to meet with people on um so when you're networking like yeah network you know network across but network with things to talk about now again i get it you know you can sometimes you just want to go network you just want to start meeting people that's great do that but as you continue in the business you continue doing things conversations and things are going to continue to open up for you when you have more things to talk about uh from yourself like oh i'm doing this i've done this this that i was doing got into here this that I was doing got picked up by here. Oh yeah, you know what? I know somebody who works at Peacock, blah, blah, blah. Boom, now you just made a connection. So just, just have things in your bag. And then that just goes back to always working on something. Always be doing something as an actor. I can't even tell you how many friends of mine audition, 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 and don't do anything. That's all they do. Wow. They don't, they're not in class. And, and I'm not a big proponent of staying in acting class. 52 weeks out of the year I'm, I'm still in acting class but like I, i'm in acting class and then i hop out and then i hop back in and then i hop out or i work privately with my coaches so um the way that you have things in your bag and the way that you start to network the right way is by continuing to work continuing to write continuing to get with people to shoot stuff now look there's so many easy ways a lot of people do these skits now a lot of people, you know, do the skits and they claim they're comedy people and they claim they're funny now, whether they're funny or not. At the end of the day, they have a bunch of content. Mm -hmm. So, and there's a whole bunch of places now where you can put your skits up. So to me, there is just no reason why you shouldn't be constantly creating things. So, and that's how you, to me, that's how you really go in and network with people. And that's how you really start to open doors uh, by just the more content that you have, the more things that you're doing. Right. And then when you network, of course, you build those relationships with people in the trust. Because I always, well, I don't really like share this too much, but I um, connected with a local producer. You, I don't know if you know her. You may know her. Um, Autumn Bailey Ford. Oh, yeah. I know Autumn. Yeah. So I connected with her in 2014. And I would go, she would have these get get connected networking events and I would go she knew at the time that I was an actor 
And my husband and I actually, when she did the Georgia Entertainment Gala, we helped to get sponsors for the Georgia Entertainment Gala. Never asked her for anything. She would just randomly inbox me. And one day my husband was like, you should tell her you have an animation. And I was like, I'm not, mm, no, I'm not doing that. He was like, you need to tell her. So I did. And I was like, I'm in the process. We're trying to finish writing like a whole season. And um, she was like, that, that's really great. I told her what the concept was. She was like, let me know when you're finished. I would like to read it. So before the pandemic, I sent her like, I think it was like the pilot episode and she read it during like, right when the pandemic started, she was like, oh my gosh, I love this animation. Do you have, you know, do you have this, this, and this, like the, I can't remember, like the, I guess it's like a lookbook. Do you have like your anim- it's like the Bible? Anime? Yes. Yes. So yes. I sent it all to her and she was like, I really would like to shop this around. So nice. months during the pandemic, my animation was shopped around. Now I didn't get picked up, but the whole point of the matter is it got into the faces of people who I would have never thought right. would have like, HBO Max, they did say they were interested in Disney, but we never got a final answer. So that from networking, from networking and like building a relationship with her. So yeah, you're no, that's, that's that a great is, story. Yeah, thank you. So um we're gonna take a break. Son, I want you to always remember this when it comes to doing the right thing. Let nothing stop you. Sometimes you gotta make our decisions. You can break a rule or two. But as long as it's good in your heart, and you're doing the right thing, let nothing stop. You. Okay? be right back. Welcome back to Conversations with Atlanta's Movers and Shakers. I am your host, Mandisa Johnson. Today we are having a conversation with Grinnell Ricardo Parham. So I see a lot of talk on Facebook about how it's not necessary for someone to go to school in order to become an actor. In your opinion, is this statement true? And what would be a piece of advice for a high school senior looking to pursue a career in acting? Uh, Part of me wants to say it's 100% true, but um, being a person who uh, minored in theater in college, so I guess I somewhat went to school for acting in my later years, um, the experiences that I got in my early days learning acting, being on a college campus and pursuing acting were great, excuse me, were great for me. Um, So I don't wanna sit up here and say, um, you don't need to go to school. We don't need to go to acting school. I mean, you know, to to just, to be as real as I can, no, you don't, because um, there are lots of coaches you can get with. There are lots of programs you can get into. There's a, there are lots of mentors that you can work with um, that will, you know, just as much, if not more, help you get into the business. Now, at the end of the day, it, it all falls on your grind and your hustle. How bad do you want it? Um, no acting coach is going to get you a job. No acting school is going to get you a job. Um, what acting schools can do is they can teach you how to screen, right? They can teach you um, if you wanna get into camera work and be a DP, they can teach you all of those things. But one thing acting school and theater programs, one thing they don't teach you, and we talked about this earlier in the conversation is they don't teach you the business side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is a huge proponent of it. Like that is, that's it's almost a bigger proponent than the whole talent aspect of it. Um, if you don't know how to navigate the business, if you don't know how to take headshots that will get you results, if you don't know how to shoot projects that will get you results, then it's just a hobby. And that's okay if it's a hobby. 
Um, there's nothing wrong with it being a hobby. In fact, most people, it ends up just being a hobby, just being completely honest. But um, for those of us that like eat, breathe and sleep this, um, one way or another, you're gonna get the job done. Like one way or another, it's not a hobby. It's not gonna be a hobby. Um, so, so the young kids out there or anybody thinking about going to acting school, um, I, I would just say, look at the cost of it. Look at the cost of acting school as opposed to finding programs. Like there are amazing theater coaches in New York, like amazing people that, that, that taught me amazing things. Um, there are other programs in New York that you can get into. You can get into three month long acting classes, six month long acting classes. There's acting conservatories in New York. Um, there are there are alternatives you can do as opposed to you know just going to a, going to a program for four years and learning acting. Not to say there's anything wrong with that, but my thing is is again I'm just going to keep it real for people. I would not go to acting school and get yourself in debt for it. I would not go to I would not go to school with anything and get yourself in debt for it. But right. some things you kind of have to these days, like I get it, but I would not go to acting school or screenwriting classes or DP program or director's programs and get yourself in debt for it. I just wouldn't do that if I were you because there are so many options to taking courses now and getting on payment plans and working with people, getting people to work with you. And again, I'm saying this, from someone who has debt, from someone who went to school and I didn't have parents that, or family members that could help me out on the financial side of things. So um, telling this, telling this to, to the audience from my experiences of someone going to college, having debt, as opposed to being out of school long enough, seeing that side of it where it's like, oh, okay, I could have learned X, Y, and Z, but I, I, you know, one thing I don't like to do the whole like, oh man, well maybe if I would have did not, nah, because that was my journey, that was my path, like that. That's what was meant to happen to me. I'm not worried about the debt. I'm not worried about any of that because again, I know my destiny. I know how things are going to work out for me. So I'm not worried about all that. So people that are just getting into it, like if your heart is telling you to go to college. If your heart is telling you to go to a conservatory, if your heart is telling you to go to London and study or, or, or um, audition nine times to get into Juilliard, do it. If your heart is telling you to do that, do it. All I'm saying is there are other ways to do it. There are other cost-effective ways to do it. Now, yes, going to Juilliard, going to Yale School of Drama, going to certain places, you can emulate that experience. Those are unique experiences for kids that have earned, you know, the chance to get in there. That's amazing for them. For me, I learned 90% of what I know, acting wise, filmmaking wise, when I was in New York, out of school, in New York doing theater, in LA, out of school, learning, teaching myself how to create things, working with different people, uh, learn teaching myself how to screen write, going through trial and error on set being a producer, going through trial and error on set being a director. Um, and now I have these experiences now that I can share with people. So, you know, I'll give you both sides of the coin on that one. So follow your heart is my best advice for it because I was following my heart and my heart told me to go to school for theater. Go, those last couple of years of college studies theater in school. But then from there, I look, I got asked plenty of times to go into conservatories. I got asked plenty of times to go into this program, go into that program. I just didn't really see the need for that. I was just like, I'm going to get in New York. I'm going to study theater. I'm going to get with a theater. I'm going to get with an acting class. I got with a few different theater companies. And this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to learn. And that's what I, that's, that's the path that I took. Uh, that's a great piece of advice. So um, just kind of like a spinoff question of, from that because you keep talking about like the business and people not knowing the business side of I feel like the, the entertainment business side is important mainly because that's what my background is but do you feel like that because of course there's theater in high schools do you feel like it would be like a good idea since Atlanta's like 
growing a lot entertainment industry wise that um, an entertainment business program would be beneficial? 100%. And I think there should be more industry professionals coming out of their positions and actually talking to people. Now, I get it, you know, the entertainment business, it's like a closed door industry. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you can't really get into these doors unless you know somebody or unless you've proven yourself. Um, or these days, unless you have a, a large enough following. But, um, you know, I, I would love to see more of those programs instituted. And I would love to see more professional screenwriters going into a class or going in or whatever, doing Zooms and having people look at their Zooms. But, you know, I get it. A lot of people do things now. They don't want to do things for free. So a lot of people will come in and a lot of people will do these Zooms and these webinars and these things like that. But you got to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. If I was in a position and, and I was, and I know I say this now and I get it, once you get to that position, you're a very busy person. You don't have a lot of time to do a lot of free stuff. I get it. But I, I just, I can't see myself. I mean, even now, like, you know, I'm, I'm dropping knowledge and I don't ever want to get paid for this. Um, so when I get to a position, like I, I can record something for 45 minutes and, and just let, you know, send it out there for people to watch. But, you know, I, producers, producers are a huge, huge, huge part of this business. All the shows that are shot in Atlanta, let's just say, you know, the producers of The Walking Dead. Granted, they are super busy. They have three spinoff shows. I think they finished shooting the regular Walking Dead. But anyway, my point is, is like, imagine if one of those producers, just one of them, went into a class and started talking to students about the business side of it how they pick actors, what they look for, um, how the process works from casting to them, what it looks like on set, do's and don'ts of being on set, how to get on their radar, how to network with them. Like there are so many questions that can be answered for people that so many people in the business don't answer. Why? Because it's a closed door policy. Exactly. They and that's, don't, they yeah. Don't. Go ahead. They don't want you to, they don't want you to know these things that you, you'll know these things once you get in that door, once you, once you break these doors down, once you break these windows and these walls down and now you're in, then you start to learn the tricks of the trade. Then you start to learn how things really work. It's almost like, not to get too deep into it, but it's almost like an underworld in a sense where it's like, there's all of us out here. There's all of us actors, all of us producers, all of us are out here trying to get this, trying to get that, trying to do this and that. But all of us are kind of working. All of us are here moving around, doing this, doing that. And in between all of this, there's a small number of people moving and shaking. And there's a small number of things going on, which in reality are all of the productions, all of the commercials. All You got this whole outside group of people trying to figure out, trying to work, trying to do this, trying to do this, trying to figure out how to get in to these little cracks, try, how to get into these little doors. Meanwhile, there's a whole other world working around you and moving around you, but you don't know until you're there, until you're inside. So um, that's why like, I'm so big on the business side of it. Like, once you figure that out, once you get your in, once you, you know, however it happens, you know, we see what happened to Issa. Issa was doing web series and she was doing a lot of indie stuff. However, she got to HBO, which, you know, she had some connections and she had some people, whatever, whatever. Soon as she got into those doors at HBO, you saw what happened. Things started opening up for her. Now she moves in a totally different lane. And, um, you know, I really respect her because she drops a lot of gems on people. Um, you know, networking across, don't network up, how to network. Um, you know, so anyway, not to veer too far off, but um, yeah, I hope that answers it. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of what you talked about is what Atlanta Film and TV tries to push. Um, I've actually sat on a few panels for like schools, career days, um, virtual career days. That's like one of my big things, especially when I got into the industry. I was like, wow, you know, you have all this stuff filming. And people, there's kids that see like, okay, they see the yellow and black signs. Well, mom, what is that sign for? Well, maybe if we like educate them, tell them, you know, this is, this is what the sign is. This is, you know, of course you can act, but then you also have, there's the other side you have behind the camera. So the last big 
well, one of the last big panels that I was on was with Decatur Hive. My son was, when my son was a junior and um, it was myself. I don't know if you know Maria Leatis. She has, she's an actress, but she has a company called Cart Reel Films and they do um, demo reels. And I had a lady named Glenetta Griffin. She has a studio out in Fayetteville. It's called the Georgia Media Academy. And they do like media, they do, act, she does acting classes for both adults and um, kids. And she does like a whole big thing. And then I had a guy named Joshua Leonard, who is a, um, he's a character designer. He's an African-American character designer who has his own animation. Uh, special needs kids that all have superpowers. So we were all on the panel, just different aspects of the industry, just teaching kids. But that that's one thing that I want to do is to bring more of the entertainment business side into school. Because I'm like, of course, you know, Decatur, for instance, they have a very good theater department, but it's just like, do they know the business side? Like once they graduate, because I know a lot of times those kids want to do theater in college or they want to just get into the industry here, but they don't have a clue like how to read a contract. How do you negotiate? Because sometimes, you know, you it could be as basic as signing a non-disclosure agreement when you are a background actor, but you just signing your name, not having any idea of what it says. And people don't know that you can ask other people who may know what it says. Right. I've seen so much wrong stuff like back in the day from where like people sign non-disclosure agreement, but they go ahead and post something on Facebook. I'm like, oh, you right. signed your name to this, but if they yeah. had known the business side of the industry, you would have known that is not okay to post that. So we do have, I do have a workshop specifically for moms. Um, it's how, you know, to break into the business of entertainment for their kids and it is a cost it's not it's not even a hundred dollars but um I mean I, I get hit up all the time like I want to get my kid in this I'm like it you know it's great that you want to get them into this but I do teach the business side of it so you'll know right. you'll be like well-rounded so yeah. well yeah and, that, and that's a good point I mean you know as far as yeah, parents with the kids and you know, everybody, again, we want to hit this home run. We want to get our kids auditions. We want to do that. And again, I, I don't have any kids, so I don't want to sound like, you know, but just from acting with kids, being in auditions with kids and talking to, I have friends who are, are have kids and want them to be actors. Yeah, they just want to get them photos and they just want to put them here and put them there. And it's like, okay, but you got to understand like there's a whole nother side of what you're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're using your kids' images. They, they'll have your kids' images forever. Um, how are you getting compensated on that on the back end? Are, you, are there renewal options? Um, is your, do you have an agent? Is your agent negotiating in your best interest or in their best interest, uh, meaning the agent's best interest over your interest? So just, just a, lot, um, a lot to learn, totally. And, and that's a good point, too. You mentioned it, you know, as much as um actors and producers and writers can come to say yeah i mean a lot of crew people can come to do workshops and lead lead seminars and things like that for people that want to get behind the camera and do things again i don't we never had these things growing up we never even um like i just don't even think people were thinking to do these things like to have someone come in and talk to us about the business side of making a movie you know, like it just, just, you know, so yeah, I think it's time that we think outside the box and just begin to continue to, to educate ourselves. Right. I, I agree. So what would be a piece of advice you would have for an aspiring filmmaker? Some advice I would give to aspiring filmmakers are um, become multi-talented in this business, become multi-talented in making a film. Don't have your film stopped because you ran out of money to pay somebody to do something. Now I get it, you, you know, we can't do everything, um, but you know, eventually I'm gonna learn to start editing. So I will, I have, I have some camera people. I know some camera stuff, I know, um, 
uh, you know, I, I know my shot list, I know uh, lenses, um, but I'm not a DP. So I don't know specific cameras and transcoding and, and all these things that you do on the back end to get these things on a theater screen. So, but, um, you know, I, I learned acting. I taught myself to screen, right? Um, uh, through trial and error, I became a director. Through trial and error, I became a uh, producer. Um, I always considered myself a creator, a creative. I always had ideas that needed to get out there. I just learned how to put them in a screenwriting format. So that is my advice to filmmakers, like figure out, you know, it may sound cliche, but like just figure out a way to get your stuff done. Figure out a way to get your stories told. Um, you know, you got to be very creative when you write, meaning you got to write. I don't even know if I should say this because this is a controversial thing, but, you know, writing within your budget, you know, a lot of screenwriters, a lot of screenwriting programs will tell you not to. They'll tell you to just write. They'll tell you to, you know, don't let your story be stifled by budget. Well, the reality is in indie filmmaker land, most of the times you're shooting out of your own money or you have a group of people who are coming in or you've been lucky enough to have other people give you money. I'm not gonna sit up here, for me, Ronnell, I'm not gonna sit up here and write a scene uh, and expect to shoot it like a Marvel movie. Mm -hmm. Not gonna do it. So I have to create things within the parameters of how I see I can shoot it. Now, does that stifle your creativity sometimes? Yes, it does. That is the indie hustle. Indie hustle, that's what we call it, indie film hustle. Like, these are the things you have to do as an indie filmmaker that obviously when you get to a certain level, you don't have to do these things. Um, you know, that, that's, that's probably the sharpest advice I can give people is to figure out ways to become multi-talented um, as a filmmaker so that you can get your stuff done. Because I've seen so many projects stop because, oh, we couldn't find a writer. Oh, we couldn't find an editor. Or, oh, this editor wants too much. Or, or this writer wants too much. Or, you know, we got to find a line producer. Teach yourself how to be a line producer. Right, yes. Come on, like, come on. Teach yourself how to be a line producer. Don't get me wrong, line producers are very important when you're up at those certain levels. It's good for you to learn to be a line producer anyway, so you know how to budget what you're doing. So you know everywhere that, that your money's going to. So that's only gonna help you. So like, and, and I say that because I, I've, I've seen projects stop because they couldn't find a line producer. I'm like, what? Wow. So that, that's, that's my advice. Um, to, to local filmmakers or aspiring filmmakers out there. Don't, you know, and, and this is just for actors too, like, don't just be an actor. I'm telling you, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you. Don't just be an actor, you're more than that. Now, I'm not saying just being an actor, like it's, if you're an actor, if, if that is amazing. You have been called to do something truly unique, inspiring and, and incredible in life. But the business side of what I'm about to say is being an actor is no longer good enough. Mm. Being just an actor is no longer good enough. So do more, create. Because here's the thing, all of us actors, we're all creative people at the end of the day. We all have things that we wanna say and express. Go, to, go, go figure out a way to tell a story, cast yourself as the lead. So that's a great that's a great piece of advice. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any final thoughts or gems you would like to share? Um final thoughts or gems, I would say uh we're we're more powerful united, meaning um as indie filmmakers and and you know, again, I mentioned this whole closed door stuff that we see in the business. Like, as more of us 
come together, more filmmakers of all backgrounds and all colors, and we all come together and we all put up our own money or we all do this and get money from other places, we can begin to create more outlets for us. It doesn't, it shouldn't be three main streamers. It shouldn't be Netflix, Hulu, and Prime. You know, Peacock is there now. Now you got the HBO Plus and the, or the, uh, is it HBO Plus? You got Paramount Plus. You got all these other places. Cool, that's great. Um, we can do, we can do better. We can do more than that. We don't have to go the studio route anymore, although that's great. I'm, I'm in talks to, to do something with a studio. Um, we don't have to do that anymore. And we don't have to go, we don't have to fight and claw and scratch to try and get our stuff read by the top three streamers. We don't have to do that. Like we can create our own audience base. Like we have the talent, we have the skill, we're building our funds to do it. We, you know, we have the connections. And again, you know, that's, that's kind of my, my grift sometimes with, with people in the business. Like they only want to work with each other. They only want to work with people of the same level. They only want to do this. They don't want to work with the indie guy. They don't want to work with the indie girl or someone who's lower than them. Like, you know, I just feel like if we all come together, we all continue to, to make projects and us, and not just that, like we need more outlets. We need more people with capital to, to create things, not just with capital, but we need more people to create more streaming avenues for us. We need more than one network. We have Oprah Winfrey Network. I don't know of any other Black network. Mm -mm, no. I don't know. Is there a Hispanic network? Is there an Asian network that, like, you know, that does content and it can bring all of us on it? Like, we just have, like, networks right now, and it's like we're all fighting to try and get on these networks. Right. Well, have you ever heard of the Black News Network? There was the Black News Network. Okay. Um, they, they literally... In March they just shut down mm -hmm. um, but it was a whole bunch of like news shows but I feel like it would have they would have done better if they would have had more like black shows black sitcoms or whatever but yeah. Oprah Winfrey I mean we have we have TV one we have bounce um we have a few networks we have all black network which is up and coming we have BET plus um but I, again, I just, I, I think we can do more. I think we can do better. Um, and again, this isn't just black people, this is all people. And again, everything that I'm saying, it's not, it's not uh, an exclusion of anybody. Um, I just think that, you know, people like myself, and that's just why, you know, a big thing with me now is like representation matters. Like I'm going to get a seat at the table regardless. My only thing is, is like, I just don't want to be the only one of me at the table. Right. I'm tired of seeing that. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, so that's that's a lot of what I'm focused on. You know, I see myself being at the table. I just don't want it to just be me at the table. Right. Wow. That was a great gym. Um, so how can people connect with you? Uh, yeah, so people can... Um, reach out to me uh, on my website, ronnellrparham.com, uh, or my production website, 5r-productions.com. Um, you guys can hit me on Instagram at ronnellsgram5 uh, at 5r Productions. Uh, I'm on Facebook, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter. I, I seem to kind of have a lot of the same handles. I think my Twitter handle is a little different. I might change that back just so everything could be the same. Um, but yeah, just, you know, honestly, I feel like I'm lucky in a sense that there aren't a lot of Ronnells in the world. Um, so, or a lot of Ronnells in the business. So Ronnell Parham, just, uh, kind of look me up, Google me and, um, you'll figure out a way to hit me up. So, uh, I'm always interested in ideas. I'm always interested in pitches. Um, I'm always interested in collaborations with people and uh you know again leveling across not leveling up or, or networking across not networking up like if you're going to reach out to me if you're going to if you're going to bring something to me like you got to be just as hungry or hungrier because i'm getting it so you know i only want people around me that are just as passionate about changing the landscape of this business because that's that's really what i see myself doing and, and i don't sugarcoat that i don't um 
you know, that's not a wish. That's not a dream. That's not a hope. Like, no, that's what I'm doing. I'm already doing it. And I'm going to continue to do that. So I would love uh, more people around me to, to do that. Well, thank you for joining us today. And thank if you, you know anyone else that could be our next Atlanta mover and shaker, go to atlantafilmandtv.com to fill out our potential Atlanta movers and shakers application. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Take care.